DBS reporting earnings just this morning. This is Southeast Asia's largest lender, posting a 37% jump in quarterly net profit. It did miss estimates though. However, for the full year, profit jumped 44% to a record high of 6.8 billion Singapore dollars as loan growth rose. The bank also sounding positive about the outlook with rates expected to go up. Who better to discuss that outlook than Piyush Gupta? He's the CEO of DBS Group, joining us live from Singapore for a first on CNBC interview. And Piyush, it's been a while since we've spoken, so thank you so much for joining us today. Let's get straight into this latest set of results. First of all, just characterize the quarter and the year for me. And where is the bank now seeing traction in the recovery? Well, um, Dan, it's been a solid year, perhaps uh, one of the best years I've seen in a long time. And uh, that includes a very robust growth in the balance sheet. We had 9% loan growth, uh, the highest in seven, eight years. Sort of like the oil price you were talking about, actually. Uh, and it's been broad-based uh, across multiple industries, sectors, uh, and geographies. Uh, we had outstanding deposit growth. In fact, in the last two years, we've had a $140 billion sing dollar increase in our CASA base, which has taken our current account savings account ratio to 76%. Now, as you can imagine, that portends really well for a rising interest rate environment. Our fee income was 15% uh, up, that's very strong double digit, and that included growth in wealth management, in credit cards, in transaction services, in investment banking, so extremely broad-based. And perhaps most important, our expenses and our cost of credit uh, stayed very well controlled through the year. In fact, a lot of the tailwind we got last year was from a very uh, manageable, benign, in fact, credit environment uh, and an improving portfolio, which caused us to have to reverse some of the general provisions which we had uh, taken in 2020 out of uh, prudence. So uh, altogether, great year. Fourth quarter was uh, decent. Some uh, natural slowdown, which is cyclical. Fourth quarter tends to be somewhat slower. Uh, some headwinds from the choppy equity markets uh, and therefore the Treasury markets business had a slowish December. Uh, some macro potential tightening by the authorities over here in the mortgage front. And so a little bit of a slowdown, but as I look forward into 2022, uh, the potents are actually quite positive. Our pipelines are robust. Uh, there's a lot of economic activity around the region. And as countries slowly learn to live with Omicron, you can see the economies are beginning to open up. So I'm uh, somewhat positive. Indeed, Piyosh, Asian economies are bouncing back from the pandemic, but some, like Singapore, I guess you could say, say still behind the curve when it comes to opening up. What does the economic runway, the economic trajectory look like moving forward here, given your guidance of mid to single digit loan growth through 2022? What underpins that call? Well, you know, some of the growth, I we grew 9% last year, despite the clamp down uh, on the opening up of, of economies around the region. Some of this is just a bounce back from previous years. Some of it just reflects uh, investment cycle. Uh, people haven't put money into a new productive capacity. And as uh, demand, especially export demand continues to be robust, and there is a pickup in some consumption demand in the region, that's helpful. Uh, governments are continuing to invest money, fiscal stimulus and uh, investment dollars, and therefore loan continues to, uh, the loan book continues to reflect that um, uh, as well. Uh, it's interesting that if you look at our credit card spend, that's a good uh, barometer. Total card spend is, uh, for last year, was about 5% over 2019. But in the fourth quarter, credit card spend was up 10% uh, quarter, I mean, compared to the same quarter the previous year. Now, this also includes the fact that travel-related spend is still less than half of what it used to be, which just tells you that everything else has bounced back quite nicely. We've also seen this major repricing of rate expectations in recent weeks, and that's going to have significant implications for your bottom line. I was listening over to some commentary earlier. I think you said last quarter that you're expecting two and a half rate increases in 2022. Where do you stand now, given the change that we're seeing in the United States and, of course, rapidly shifting expectations on what the rates trajectory is going to look like moving forward? Well, my own base case assumption is a rate hike every quarter, so you get four hikes in the course of the year. But I'm mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, market watchers and some houses are talking as many as uh, seven rate hikes of the year. You just said... Fed Governor Bullard is talking about getting to 1% in the first half of the year itself. I think a lot of what actually happens uh, will be data dependent. 
if the inflation rate continues to stay sticky and if you continue to see a six uh, or seven handle over the next uh, few months, then it could be that the Fed and central bankers will react more sharply than I anticipate. Uh, my own sense though is that because of base year effect uh, as well as uh, some of the transitory effects are running off, you should start seeing inflation leveling off uh, as you get into the summer. And if that is the case, then my four uh, rate hike base scenario might well come to pass. Yeah, look, I think it's anyone's guess at this point, and you're exactly right. It is going to be data dependent, as the Fed says. But help me understand what this is going to mean for the bank financially, because obviously this could be a significant tailwind. Can investors perhaps expect rising dividends, larger payouts as a result of that windfall? Well, you know, we are obviously very um, positively uh, correlated to interest rate cycles. Uh, in the past, you know, in the last uh, two years, uh, the eight rate cuts since the summer of 2019 have caused us to give up almost $3 billion in interest income. So it's not difficult to understand why a corresponding increase in interest rates should give us a $3, $4 billion tailwind in terms of the total income that we create. We've uh, sort of guided to 18 to $20 million of in in income gains per basis point of interest rate increases. Uh, a lot of this does flow to the bottom line. So that's obviously very helpful and very healthy. Against this, we'd have to keep one eye on, does the macroeconomy slow down? And do you start winding up seeing a little pickup in credit costs as rates start going? But on a balanced basis, there's no doubt that we expect uh, the rate hike cycle to be extremely beneficial to a bank uh, such as us. Now, of course, as rates go up, uh, you know, we are already extremely well capitalized. And if you wind up accreting even more capital through better uh, bottom line and income growth, then there is every likelihood that we'll be able to reflect that in better payouts to our shareholders. And just finally, Piyush, before we let you go, DBS was also hit with what I would consider a very public slap on the wrist from MAS as a result of a significant online service failure. You were asked to hold more regulatory capital as a result. What impact has that had on capital ratios and what lessons learned or remedial actions have been taken now to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen again and you can ensure that the service offering continues for your customers around the region? So Dan, first of all, obviously, the, you know, we're embarrassed and um, uh, in truth, uh, customers are right to expect more from us. We had an uh, unreasonable uh, downtime of almost uh, 38, 40 hours. Um, having said that, uh, the fact that we have to keep extra regulatory capital um, is, has an impact on us. But the truth is that we start with a huge amount of excess capital. And therefore, while it's had a material uh, bearing on the amount of dividend increase that we offered in the quarter, if you look out into the medium term, uh, we do think it will not impair our capacity or change our dividend policy uh, materially. Uh, in the meantime, we've had two or three different uh, people look at our systems, two have completed, one still going on. I think it's quite clear that the system architecture, topology, etc., uh, appears to be robust. Uh, but there's no question we could have done better in terms of our incident management and our recovery processes. And that's what we are focusing our attention on. You know, how do we monitor better? How do we make sure we understand the deep down technologies that we use better so we can respond more quickly uh, than we were able to this last time?